just kind of wanted to uh, go back and uh, we've done some charts and some timelines, but just to kind of uh, big, big picture again, you know, uh, the, the foundation for what John is, is, is telling us and the reason we understand so clearly what he's saying is based on what Daniel, the prophet, has told us. Remember, Daniel's a young teenage guy, goes into the Babylonian captivity and there over uh, the span of uh, being there for that 70 year time, uh, it receives uh, on several occasions visions and revelations from God, uh, in particular telling him about future kingdoms. He tells him that the king that he is serving at that time, Nebuchadnezzar, is like a head of gold. He's the greatest world ruler, the most powerful uh, and the, that the world would know. Uh, and then he tells them about sub, uh, other kingdoms that would come after him, the Medo-Persian kingdom, and then Alexander the Great, and how Alexander the Great, uh, as uh, he conquers the world, would die at a young age. His kingdom would be divided up into his four generals. One of them would, would uh, the, one of the uh, Seleucid's uh, uh, rulers would take over and, and uh, rule over Israel for uh, a period of time. And then he talks about the, uh, the Greeks, uh, you know, their, their kingdom, the Romans, and then it would end, but then there would be one more kingdom that would come, one world-dominating kingdom or power that would be on this earth, and it would still be yet future, and that's the kingdom that we're, uh, we're looking at here. As we got into the, the seal judgments in chapter 6, the first rider of the apocalypse was a rider on a white horse, remember, he is the Antichrist. He looks like Christ, but he comes instead of Christ. He's even wearing a crown. He comes uh, uh, with a bow, but there is no arrows. He appears to be a man of peace uh, and so forth. And the world is, uh, is being, being set up for that to take place. Uh, uh, every day, our politicians are discussing how to bring peace to the Middle East, how the, uh, the Jews could, in a way, rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount and somehow have the, uh, again, uh, the uh, Islamic rulers uh, of the Palestinians agree with that. Uh, there doesn't seem to way, be a way to see that accomplished, but we know from, again, from Bible prophecy that that will happen through the, uh, through the Antichrist. Uh, John has then told us about the, the, the rest of the seal judgments as they come, uh, these supernatural events that will take place that are for the purpose of God pouring out his vengeance on the world that have killed his, uh, um, his children, those that have come to faith in him that have been murdered for their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, again, we went through several scriptures in Revelation that talk about that's one of the purposes of these judgments. We're going to see the other two purposes, uh, at least in our text, or at least one to try to emphasize. The other one is that, again, at the end of this time period, Israel gets saved. Jesus comes back. They recognize he is the Messiah. They look upon the one they have pierced and mourn for one as one mourns for an only child. Uh, and that's certainly one of the, why would God allow this time period, this seven-year period, to be so horrific? It's, again, his vengeance upon a world that have murdered his believers in time and history, and of course, what's going to happen in the future. It's so that Israel in the end will be saved, but it's also sets the stage for a worldwide revival, and, uh, and that's part of our, our text uh, this morning. Certainly, we've seen revivals where God sovereignly moves and orchestrates events and moves in people's lives, and we have uh, just um, thousands and thousands of people coming to faith in Christ, but there's never really been a worldwide revival before, but there will be one uh, during, during the tribulation. Look back at, uh, at verse 6 there of chapter, excuse me, verse 10 of, uh, of chapter 6. We uh, went through this last week, again, talking about, uh, uh, it says, They cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth, those that have been martyred through uh, church history? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed, future tense, as they were, was completed. And, uh, and so though there's a worldwide revival uh, that's brought about through the preaching of some very, some very special evangelists, uh, when people during the tribulation accept Christ as the Lord and Savior, they are the number, they're the ones being spoken of. They will be martyred for their faith. Let's take a look at verses 1 to 8 and see this select group of people that will be protected. 
After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, uh, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, or Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. So uh, here, again, these are being protected from initially these four angels. Again, talking about uh, the, the four corners of, of the earth, it's just... Uh, uh, it's interesting, the b people that like to criticize the Bible say, oh, see, it's not very scientific, you know. It's just a figure of speech, you know, try to get over it, you know, and we use figure of speeches all the time. It just means to the ends of the earth, you know, these, uh, these angels are, are there, and they're ready to bring this judgment. Again, this is the tribulation period. We're in the first half of this seven-year period. And we've already looked at some of these judgments, and John now takes a parenthesis and says, this is what's going on with some detail. Uh, here's a scene in heaven, and I'm going to show you what produced it in terms of uh, there's all these people that have been martyred, and they're in heaven, and they're saved. And here's what brought it about during this, uh, this time period, these 144,000 uh, servants of God. The number of those uh, protected is, is given. And uh, again, 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe. A couple of things about them. They're called the servants of God in verse 3. We notice that they're sealed on their foreheads also in verse 3 with the name of God. And uh, the indication there is that they're sealed with the name of the Father and the name of the, <laughs> of the Son. Now, I don't know if it's a visible thing or, uh, again, sealed just talks about, <laughs> about their protection. Uh, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit right? Guaranteeing us uh, of, our, of our place in heaven like a deposit, <coughs> Paul says. <coughs> the Antichrist will put a seal on everybody that takes to the mark of the beast. That's his seal upon them. But uh, these guys and, and gals uh, are sealed with, you know, where they literally says something, hey, nice tat. You know, I, you know where, <laughs> Hebrew writing, I don't know, you know, uh, whether it's visible or not, uh, it will be obvious to everybody because they are going to be protected from, remember, you have these horrific supernatural events taking place, great earthquakes, stars falling from the sky, you know, sun turning, you know, dark and so on and so forth. So they are protected from God's judgments upon the earth, but they're also protected from the Antichrist who at this point is pursuing uh, anybody that has anything to do with certainly proclaiming the gospel, anybody that's come to, to faith. So they're, they're sealed from uh, both of those things. Now in verse 14, they are mentioned again, uh, pardon me, in chapter 14, verse 1, they're mentioned again, and I want to make reference to this passage a couple of times. Uh, but there it says, Then I look and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion, uh, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their forehead. So uh, that's the, the text that, uh, that tells us that uh, uh, God's name is, is upon them. We also note just the obvious. They come from all the tribes of, uh, uh, of Israel, 12,000 from each one. Uh, but with that, uh, if you look at that list and compare it to other lists, you'll notice a couple of uh, things that are important. One is that uh, Dan and Ephraim are missing from, from the list. Uh, the 12 tribes of Israel are mentioned in the Bible 29 times, and it's not always the same list. And it's a little bit like a shell game. There's a symmetry that kind of has to be kept because it's the 12 <laughs> tribes of Israel. So when they're dividing up the land, for example, with Joshua, they're going to divide up the land. The, the family, the tribe of Levi, doesn't get an inheritance because they're the priests. Their inheritance is God. 
right? So uh, they don't get a portion of the land. How do you get 12? Well, you take Joseph's two sons, Ephraim, Manasseh, and you plug them in. You still got 12. So there's a, a symmetry that's always there, and that's why sometimes, hey, the names are different here. How come the name? Well, it's for a different purpose. Uh, but here it's interesting because uh, we could say the reason that Dan and Ephraim are not here is so that so this symmetry of 12 would be maintained, and it certainly is. But it could be a, a reason far greater than that. Uh, Dan and Ephraim were the tribes that were responsible for bringing idolatry into Israel. And uh, let, let me just kind of back up and give you the little history. You remember Joshua, you know, conquers the land. They do their, the, the main military commands, the uh, campaigns. They cu cut the nation in two. They conquer to the south. They conquer the north. And they kind of settle the whole thing. And then Joshua, towards the end of his life, then does the division of the land. It tells the heads of those tribes or families, now you've got to go and settle in and drive out anybody that's left into those, uh, in those territories. Dan goes to his allotted territory and says, too hard, you know, <laughs> too many people, too big. Uh, and so he, he's really not obedient to what the Lord's given him or believes or have the faith that God could uh, deliver them from the people remaining in his allotted territory. So he sends out some scouts and they head up north and there's where it's beautiful, and northern Israel is absolutely uh, beautiful up there. And they go up there, and uh, it looks like a good spot for them, and there aren't any major tribes and so forth in that area. So they go up and resettle. So when you, we say you go to Israel and you want to see the whole thing, you go from Dan to Beersheba. In other words, you go from the, the furthest point north to the furthest point south, and they settle in there. Later then, after... The kingdom splits. David reigns, his son Solomon reigns, and then his son Rehoboam takes over uh, and against the counsel of his father's advisors would say, don't overtax the people. You know, keep the country together. It's a fragile time. He takes the advice of his buddies and decides to overtax everybody. I'm glad that's not a problem anymore. And, uh, and so the people went out and began to have these tea parties and these big protests here in Israel. It's just a joke. But uh, they were very, they were upset enough that, uh, and that's what happened. It was over taxes that the kingdom is split. The 10 northern tribes, you know, basically formed their own country of Israel. The, t the other two remaining tribes in the south make up the country now of, of Judah. Uh, and when they do that and they, they have their own thing, they're now no longer connected to Jerusalem to the temple to the, be able, uh, the ability to worship the Lord. So Dan, the tribe of Dan, comes up with the idea: we'll build our own temple. In fact, we'll build one here uh, in the northern Israel. And, and uh, the last time we were, uh, Kathy and I were there, we actually saw the foundation to this temple and saw it was old now, but it was a new archaeological dig at the time. It was uh, it was pretty amazing. Uh, but so there's that temple, and then they build another one in, in Bethel. They introduce idol worship to Israel. And uh, again, because Bethel is in the land of Ephraim and the other one is in the land of Dan. That could be very well why they are left out of the list. So there's 144,000 Jews that are saved. There's, uh, there's nothing that says they're all men, men and women. They seem to be from all over the world. Um, we're going to make a case that a lot of them certainly could come right out of uh, Israel itself. Uh, and then they are protected supernaturally from the events that are going on, the earthquakes and so forth. They're protected from the forces of the Antichrist. They're sealed, and they're going to go out and, and bring about a worldwide uh, revival. Now, uh, just to go back to this idea about uh, uh, the tribe of Dan and Manasseh, uh, very, it's very interesting because uh, the last time the 12 tribes are mentioned, that list matches the first time in chronological order. The first time it's, uh, in Genesis that they're given, the last time in chronological order is in the millennial kingdom. It's by Ezekiel. Ezekiel gives us the last chronological list. And it's uh, as you and I will enter the millennial city of Jerusalem there one day on this earth with Jesus Christ ruling and reigning. And on the gates of that city, the 12 tribes of Israel will be listed. And Dan and Ephraim's names are there. 
And so you have to ask yourself, how do they get back on the list? It is by the grace of God. Every time we walk in, we'll go, Dan, it free him. God is gracious. It'll just, you know, so many things will just remind us of, of God's grace. And it also tells us that, that when his children, even though they turn to idolatry, and again, idolatry is anything that comes between you and your ability to worship God. That could be a person, a thing, a career, could be any number of things. Anything that comes between you and your relationship with God, your ability to worship God, is an idol. And um, that, uh, that God can still, by his grace, bring us back and redeem us and, and save us from that. And a lot of times, it's those idols that really prevent us from coming to faith in Christ to, uh, to start with. I know I had... Uh, I had my share of them, and my biggest one growing up was just simply athletics and trying to get to that next level and keep playing and, uh, and so forth. And God was gracious enough to have a drunk run into the back of me in, in the car and uh, gracious enough to let me fall asleep at the wheel at 70 miles an hour before anybody knew what seatbelts were and, uh, and then uh, tried to recover from all of that. And then he was uh, gracious enough to allow me to develop a an ulcer finally, and because uh, I had a coach that was from hell, and uh, and uh, it was very tough, and uh, and so that all of that that idol was gone, it just ended. That was gone. Uh, unfortunately, I just turned to the next idol, the next idol, the next idol until they were all gone, and uh, and then I got down on my knees and and received the Lord. But God is. Gracious, and even though we don't see Dan and Ephraim on this list, they make it on the final list. Uh, I think it'll be a constant reminder to us of God's grace. Let me just read one passage that, that talks about this idea of what happens to the children of Israel when they fall into idolatry. What would the consequences be? It applies to our situation here. Deuteronomy 29 20. The Lord would not spare him a person like that that turns to idolatry. For then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy would burn against that man, and every curse that is written in this book would settle on him, and the Lord would blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord would separate him from all the tribes of Israel for adversity according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in the book of the law. So a whole tribe, two tribes, get separated God keeps his word, but at the same time, by God's grace, uh, they make it back on the list. Let's go back to Revelation 14, because I want to read the, uh, the rest of that passage. I read verse 1. I want to read down to verse 5, if you want to flick back over there again, because it's a, a direct, you know, John writing again about the same group of people. And it's amazing how the Bible is a great commentary on the Bible, you know. Uh, it says there, John saying, Then I looked, and behold, as we read before, a lamb standing on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And then notice also in verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sing, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Uh, maybe it's all guys then. What do you think? I think that kind of sums that one up. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So just, again, this group of people that are protected, that are sealed, uh, a couple other things about them. One is they did not defile themselves with women, for they are virgins. They, again, the context is tribulation is going on. Uh, and there's two thoughts. One is that is... is um, as sexual immorality is rampant in our culture, take all the Christians out of this world in the rapture. It doesn't get better. It gets much worse. So it could be, it's just talking about their, uh, their moral in, in, the, in the midst of a Im, very immoral world. Or it could be the fact that literally this is it. You know, Paul talks about the advantages of being single for preaching the gospel. And it may be because of the extreme circumstances, the limited time. And God set them apart for this one special occasion and event that uh, they do not marry. In other words, in a Jewish context, they're following a Nazarite vow that we see a few times in the Old Testament. 
Secondly, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. It speaks of their obedience as well as their dedication. And then, of course, they are the first fruits to God uh, and to the Lamb. So, again, first fruits in the Old Testament, whatever we have that phrase mentions, it means this is a small part of a greater thing that is coming. Uh, literally in, uh, in Israel in the spring, a little bit of the crops would be harvested, a little bit, and then offered to God uh, at the Feast of First Fruits as a sacrifice, saying, we believe that you're going to give us a greater harvest in, in the fall. Uh, and then that, that symbolism is used in, in other places as it is here. These 144,000 come to faith in Christ, these Jewish believers, and Jesus now is the Messiah, and then they are going to be sealed and protected, and they are the first fruits of a great harvest that's going to be uh, worldwide. Which leads to the question of, if all of the Christians are gone in the rapture, how do they get saved? And it's probably because J. Vernon McGee is still on the radio somewhere, still <laughs> preaching. I say that because J. J. Vernon has been been with the Lord for many years, but his radio ministry continues. That always shocks people sometimes when they find out that, uh, uh, that he's been with the Lord for many years. But uh, uh, So that could, that's one view. It's J. Vernon McGee and the Bible bus that uh, saves all these people. That's view one. Uh, the second uh, view simply could be that uh, they get saved the way the Apostle Paul gets saved. God just supernaturally does it. He just kind of knocks them on the ground somewhere and says, Hello, I'm Jesus, and I die for your sins, like he did the Apostle Paul. And that's the way many people are getting saved in the Middle East today. And uh, Joel Rosenberg uh, has talked about that uh, in some uh, occasions that he's been teaching, and it's in uh, his book that we've got back there, uh, Coming World uh, Revolution. There's just many, many, and then most of these cases, we're talking about Muslims that have a vision or a dream, and Jesus appears before them, explains that he died for their sins and so on and so forth. And then these men and women walk into find a Christian church somewhere already saved. And they want to know what must I do to now be a disciple and, uh, and follow Jesus and so forth. So that could be a way that they get saved. That would certainly be uh, view number two. View number three, I think is very interesting as well. And that is, it could be that God has already set the stage in our day for this to happen by bringing so many, so many Jews back to Israel who believe in a personal Messiah. We'd say they have messianic expectations. We talked about there are some in Israel who are secular, but they're in a sense looking for a Messiah in terms of a political leader. The stage is certainly set for the Antichrist, but there are hundreds of thousands of Jews in Israel today that have been brought there from other places that believe in a personal Messiah. They don't know that it's Jesus yet, but they believe it's personal, whereas a lot of Jews believe Israel is the Messiah. The land of Israel is the Messiah that was promised. That's where they come. The country is their savior and so forth. And there's uh, actually some, some best-selling books by Jew Jewish authors that actually uh, portray this that are very interesting to look at and read, but it kind of gives you insight into where uh, so many people are. But what has changed in Israel is, uh, for example, in 1991, there was a military covert operation called Operation Solomon. Uh, the uh, Ethiopian government at the time looked like it was about ready to fall to, to rebels and so forth. Uh, and there were uh, thousands and thousands of Ethiopian Jews living uh, in that country uh, at the time whose lives would then be at risk. Uh, Israel knew that. And so the year before, they began planning, and then when it looked like the opportunity was there and they had no choice, then they, they launched Operation uh, Solomon. Uh, very, very interesting. They, uh, let me give you a couple of statistics. One of them is the operation set a world record for a single flight passenger load on May 24, 1991, when an El Al 747 carried 1,122 passengers to Israel. The 1,087 passengers were registered, but dozens of children hid in their mother's robes. Planners expected to fill the aircraft with 760. Because the passengers were so slight, many more squeezed in and two babies were born on the flight. Uh, and this thing went uh, on and on. In 36 hours of nonstop flights with 34 Israeli aircraft, including... Um, IFA C-130s and El Al cargo planes, they transported in 36 hours 14,325 Ethiopians to, to Israel and, uh, and got them out of there and out of arms, arms way. 
And those Ethiopian Jews believe in a personal Messiah and they're looking for him. And they're in Israel now, <laughs> multiplying <laughs> since 1991. When the former USSR began to fall, uh, again, uh, there's tremendous anti Semitic rhetoric in Russia today. I mean, right on national television, horrific, terrible things are said about Jewish people and why you should hate them if you're a Russian all the time. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, Israel saw that uh, this was going to come about. Uh, there were thousands, again, of Russian Jews uh, living there, uh, and they, they launched uh, uh, the same type of mission to get them out. In one month, they were able to get 400,000 Russian Jews to, to Israel. Uh, now, that presents a little bit of a, a problem in, in terms of logistics. Our country, for example, offered to give them loans, lo guaranteed loans to build housing for uh, all of these uh, Russian immigrants. Uh, Israel went, transported them, got them there, and then we reneged on our word, didn't give them a dime. Even though they are the only country that's ever paid us back a nickel for all the, all the money that we loan out to these other countries. But our administration at that time uh, reneged on the promise, didn't give them a dime. Uh, Israel overcomes these obstacles and bring these people in when nobody else will take them, when nobody else would want them. But all of these Russian immigrants believe in a personal Messiah and they believe he's coming. You know, and a lot of them, through uh, some of the ministries uh, uh, there in Israel, have, have come to faith in, uh, in Jesus now. But there's the stage is set in Israel. <clears throat> there are tens of thousands of Jews that have been gathered there that are looking for a personal Messiah that they can personally know, and they're waiting for God to send him. It's like the stage is set, and, and again, that would be one view, that the 144,000 will be of this group, and they're going to be able to go throughout the world bringing the gospel. The second thing here in our text is we get back to verse 9. There's a great multitude of people gathered at the throne as we uh, look towards heaven now. In verse 9, after these things, and we'll make reference, to, notice verse 1, there's an after these things. Verse 9 begins with an after these things. I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessings and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So this multitude of people includes all nations, tribes, peoples, and, and tongues. And again, notice the phrase, after these things. So uh, the two ideas or the two things are, are tied together. One's a cause, one's an effect. 144,000 Jewish evangelists, you're going to be out there preaching the, God, uh, preaching the gospel, protected by God. What does it produce? It produces in heaven all of these people from all over the world, every language, uh, every people group is going to be uh, represented there. Now, the prophet Joel actually spoke about this, and we're real familiar with, with the prophet Joel because Peter quotes him in, in Acts chapter 2. Uh, let me give you that context, and then we're going to read Joel's prophecy. But remember, uh, Peter and the boys uh, have uh, locked themselves into uh, an upper room there in Jerusalem, wondering if they will suffer the same fate that Jesus suffered. Will they too find themselves on a Roman cross, crucified, because it's not that many days since Jesus' death and his resurrection. They've seen him. They've been ministered to by him. They've seen his ascension and so forth. But he told them to wait into Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. They're doing that, and they got the door locked <laughs> just in case. And, uh, and you, you know, on that, uh, on that morning, then the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them. They begin praising God. It's obviously a supernatural event. Uh, and one of the things that happens as they come out into the streets or perhaps on the rooftops, probably uh, in some area where Peter ends up preaching the gospel and, and 3,000 people get saved. It's quite an event. People are gathered there. Every male, Jewish male, 20 years and older, has to come to Jerusalem three times a year. This is one of those times there's people from, from all over the, the Middle East uh, that are there. Uh, they hear them praising God in their own languages. It says that of Peter and the boys that uh, 
They were speaking Glossialia. It was a language they did not know, but the people heard a dialectic. They heard a language they could understand, their own language, uh, and, they, and they knew that they were praising God. Of course, there were the, the, the critics in the crowd that says, what is this? Have these men been drinking? And of course, on, on uh, Pentecost, you didn't drink anything until you made it to the temple. They wouldn't have even been drinking water, much less anything else. But they, they're saying, are they drunk? You know, what's going on here? And you're familiar with the criticism. Peter then, as was appropriate, must get, now get up and give a, a biblical a framework for what's going on, as should always be the case anytime God's Spirit is working in, uh, in anyone's lives. This is something supernatural going on, certainly not the uh, usual. So Peter gets up and says, this was what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. So let me, let me read that, and you're going to note a couple of things. Peter's going to basically say, we're living in the last days. And, and it's from this point, and he's going to describe what we studied last week, so it's going to go right through the tribulation period. Okay, let's go to Joel chapter 2, verse 28. I've got that for you. There, uh, Joel says, uh, Peter ends up quoting it, and it shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all, all flesh, everybody, Jews and Gentiles. Again, this is totally a Jewish context yet. And, uh, and so this is a radical thing. God will pour out his Holy Spirit on Jews and Gentiles alike. So that's a radical concept. It's something for the last days, Joel says. Then he says, your sons, your Jewish sons, and your Jewish daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream de dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also my men servant and on my maidservant. I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great awesome day of the Lord. That's exactly what we went through last week. So he's talking about the tribulation period now. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So Again, according to Peter, the last days began on that day, the day of Pentecost, the day uh, when the, the church is birthed. And those last days continue through uh, the end of the tribulation period. Those spiritual gifts that they received at that time began that day, and according to Joel, continue all the way through the end of the tribulation period. Uh, so God is going to apparently, again, set aside these Jewish evangelists, and uh, they are going to have supernatural Holy Spirit giftings uh, to be able to go out and communicate to all these people. I mean, do they really learn all of the languages of the world and um, that quickly? Is Rosetta Stone really that good? <laughs> I don't think so. You know, it's like, uh, you go over here, you need 26 languages and 42 dialects, you know, uh, you know, pull out your laptop and work real hard before you get there. I, I don't think so. I think God is going to gift them, like here, a supernatural ability to go out and preach the gospel uh, to every one of these people groups uh, around the world. And uh, how gifted do they have to be? I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, right now, half the people in the world have not heard the gospel. And, uh, and again, we're on the, the edge of this time when these things are going to be uh, happening. I don't think we're going to make a lot of headway uh, before they have this task that they will take on. Uh, currently, if, uh, if you count uh, all the missionaries that are out there really preaching the gospel from mission organizations from North America, which is predominantly where they come from, although God has raised up organizations like Gospel for Asia that seem to be a uh, a second wave that is something unique, and we've never seen anything in church history like what's going on in the Indian subcontinent. You know, again, Hudson Taylor, the great Hudson Taylor in the China Inland in, in La Mission, in his best day, had about 4,500 full-time workers in his best day. And now they've got 16,000 plus, and, and, they're, and they're growing. It's, uh, it's an incredible thing. That's what's happening. But uh, even with that, we're, we're just not getting it done. Of those 87... Those aren't frontline workers. That was, that's all the support staff, everybody back home, uh, everything. So really, we've, 
we've got a lot fewer than the 140,000 that are out there right, uh, right now. Uh, there's at least 3,000 people groups that don't have a Bible translation. There's another 17,000 what's called hidden people groups who have never even been contacted by the outside world, much less uh, ever, ever heard the gospel. But Jesus promised in Matthew 24, 14 that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. So the end is the end of the tribulation, not the end of the church age. We're not going to get it done. We should try to get it done, but we're not going to get it done before the rapture of the church. But it will get done by the end of the tribulation. It'll be accomplished by these 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Secondly, the, the great multitude of believers in the tribulation period, notice they're standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and this suggests that they, again, have died as martyrs, and we're going to see more about that uh, uh, in other places. But they are clothed with white robes, speaking of the righteousness that they have, and they have palm branches in their hand, a reminder of victory and, and rejoicing. And um, as was common as, uh, at the Feast of Sukkoth or, or Tabernacles or Feast of Booths when they would go out kind of usually in about October and, and build booths, the Jews would, and, and live outside and remember the fact that they did wander through the wilderness, but now Jesus has brought them into the land of, uh, of Israel. And when Jesus rides in on that donkey uh, in fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, they declare he's the Messiah by saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they, they wave palm branches, believing that he is the fulfillment of the feast of Sukkoth or tabernacles. Now, now the Messiah has come. Now we're really in the land and we're really complete. I just find it interesting. I don't know where they get the palm branches in heaven, but I'm curious to find that out. Does that mean there's palm trees there? But uh, it's a time of joy and it's a time of great elation. It's a time of great celebration. So again, there's a, there's a cause and effect. The tribulation begins. The Antichrist comes on the scene. These horrific judgments are being poured out. But there's 144,000 Jewish evangelists that cover the world and preach the gospel to every people group, every language that's out there. And then in heaven, they're coming. They're being martyred for their faith. There's a special place around the throne of God for them. And as we'll see in a moment, all, he all, all heaven breaks out in terms of, uh, uh, of worship and so forth. Uh, secondly, the multitude of people includes around the throne angels, elders praising God, and they're praising him for his honor, his power, and his might. And, and again, this worship is they fall before their faces as worship should be as an act of submission. When they worship God, when we worship God, we're saying, you're the boss. <laughs> We're saying we submit our life to you. You are the Lord. We worship you. Nobody's worshiping us. We're not just singing Christian karaoke. We are, we are, we are involved in an act of submission uh, where we submit our lives to the Lord and give him the worship that he's due. Let's go on to the, uh, the third thing in verse 13 to 15. There's a problem of identity that must be answered at least it was a problem for John in verse 13. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in the white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. Uh, again, indication that they're not church-age believers. I don't know. Where did they come from? So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. So the problem of identity is printed, presented to John. He confirms the fact that he, he does not know them. They're not of the church age believers that we've already seen in the book and have already been identified in heaven. Uh, the problem of identity is then answered. They've come out of the great tribulation. So Again, uh, unique, uh, a unique group of people, uniquely situated before the throne of God. Uh, it's not just all believers. You have church age believers. You have tribulation believers. Uh, you have the, those that were martyred in church history that under the altar crying out to God, uh, those that have given their lives for Jesus Christ and been martyred obviously have a special place in heaven around the throne of God and a special place in terms of the heart of God. So, 
worldwide revival. People are getting saved. They're also getting martyred, and they have a special place in heaven. This kind of leads to uh, an interesting passage in 2 Thessalonians uh, where Paul is talking the, about the same context, he talks about the lawless one who is the Antichrist, and he's on the scene, and this is all going on, and the gospel is going out, and some are rejecting it and so forth. Listen to what he says. It's, it's a little troubling. He says, the coming, this is 2 Thessalonians uh, 2 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. Satan's behind the whole thing with power, signs, lying wonders with all unrighteous uh, deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, because they did not receive the truth, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they may have uh, be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Paul says, when the Antichrist is on the scene during the tribulation period, uh, he's going to have the power of Satan working in and through his life with deception, with lies and so forth. And there's going to be people, a people group during that period of time who have rejected the truth of the gospel previously. And because they previously rejected the gospel, they are given a st strong delusion and they will not accept the truth. They'll take the mark of the beast and and their destiny will, will be with Satan. So who, who is that group of people? At the same time, you've got people that are not going to receive, but you've got people that are received. Well, at least one idea suggests the fact that the gospel is going to go out to people who have never heard it before. And the people who have heard it before and rejected it don't get it. Because there's, you know, there's those around that we share with, that we talk about, well, you know, if the rapture happens, you know, and everybody, then I'll know. I'm sorry, it might be too late at that point. If, if you know now and you reject now, there's nothing that says you get another shot later. There's nothing that says, well, when all this starts happening, then I'll know that I know. Well, even if you knew then and you did it, is it going to be easier then? You're going to have to die for your faith versus now. But uh, again, it's certainly thought-provoking and, and leads to the, some conclusions as to who is he talking about here and at least one idea is he's talking about people that have rejected now will not receive the gospel later. Those that receive it in this worldwide revival may be those that have never heard the gospel before. And as we mentioned, half the world at this time has never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. The third thing about the problem of identity is it reveals their status in, uh, in heaven. They'll be before the throne, uh, an incredible position to have. God's very presence is there uh, with them, indicating he who sits on the throne will dwell with them. The term there is, is tabernacle, and, uh, and they serve him day and night in his temple. So a, a certain position, a certain place, and certain privileges are given to these, these believers. And, uh, and they are the ones that make up, again, in terms of the purpose of the tribulation is God's vengeance is being poured out, Israel is being prepared, and there's a worldwide revival and it seems to be taking place right at the beginning uh, of the tribulation and continues for some time. The fourth thing is there's a glorious promise that's revealing in verse 16 to 17. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So the promise reveals previous hardships. In other words, if this is not going to happen, it's because it was happening. Uh, on earth, it was happening. Uh, they didn't have food. Uh, they didn't have anything to drink. Uh, they were out in the scorching heat. They were out in the blistering wind. All of this was going on because he's saying, now this stops. Now this is not happening anymore because obviously it was happening uh, previously. Now keep in mind, again, as we get further in our study, we'll realize that, that uh, without the mark of the beast, no one will buy or sell. So if, again, if you take a stand for Jesus Christ during the tribulation, you will not be able to buy or sell, and there's going to be a price to be paid. Now Jesus speaks about this group of people as well. Very interesting in Matthew 25. 
Remember Matthew 24 is Olivet Discourse. We call it that because he's on the Mount of Olives. And he's talking about the end times and the tribulation and everything that's going to happen. And we've already made reference to that uh, on, uh, on several occasions. Chapter 25 of Matthew, he comes back to rule and reign in his kingdom. And the first, one of the first things he does, there's a period of judgment. And he is dividing what he calls the sheep and the goats. Uh, sheep are the good guys. And uh, the goats aren't. Uh, people are going to be judged. Groups are going to be judged. Nations will be judged based on whether they are pro-Semitic or anti-Semitic. I don't think there's a lot of, going to be a lot of pro out there. I think it's going to be mainly uh, anti-Semitic, and it's, uh, it's very growing. Listen to what Jesus says about this group of people that were pro-Semitic, that helped Israel and helped Jews in particular during this time period. Uh, chapter 25, verse 34, Matthew's gospel. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the least of one of these, my brethren, other Jews, you did it to me. So there's Jesus' context is talking about the tribulation period, talking about these that are coming to faith in Christ, the 144,000 that are out preaching the gospel and saying that in that time when he establishes his kingdom, there will be rewards given for any that help these and help them in their mission of getting the gospel out. The other thing that's revealed here is uh, in the promise is the comfort that they will receive in heaven. Uh, it's the Lamb of God, or Jesus Christ, who will shepherd them uh, and lead them into the, uh, the living water. And, and uh, certainly that makes us think of uh, all the times that Jesus is, is heralded as the good shepherd and the typology that begins with Abraham uh, and leads all the way to the book of Revelation, that eventually the good shepherd, the great shepherd would come. And then when he's pictured here uh, in this passage, it says the shepherd once again. And it's fountains of living water. And, and again, this certainly parallels uh, the promises and the wonderful words of peace in Psalm 23. And then the Psalm, uh, excuse me, and then he uh, concludes by saying, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, an indication that there was. In other words, there, there were, what they were going through, there, there was weeping. They were going through tremendous suffering. But uh, all of that has now ended. So uh, again, uh, the Lord said he'd be promised at the end. The gospel would go to the whole world. And we actually see how one of the ways, there's still another way towards the end of the tribulation where it's going to go out again. That's very interesting. But they are going to be able to go out to, to every language and every dialect and be able to give the, the gospel out. They're going to be supernaturally protected. You and I, uh, the church, we've already been raptured. We're in heaven. There's already been some incredible times there that we, we've looked at in, in the passage. We've sung the song of redemption that the church sings. And now there's this whole other group of people that are there uh, from all of these languages and around the world. And they're gathered at the throne. And they have a song that apparently is unique to them and what the Lord has done for them and brought them through as well. And uh, it'll just be a, a, a glorious time. Uh, Again, I just, you know, we go through these things and uh, it just seems like the, the, the world, the stage, you know, is just, is just being, being set. The, um, it's hard to watch the news and not, and not think about Bible prophecy. You know, we've got, uh, there's that, have you ever heard of that country, Iran, and that guy Ahmadinejad? He's just like in there once in a while this week on the news. And uh, I don't know if you, if you had a chance, uh, if you go on Fox's uh, website, uh, they have, uh, uh, or Israel Today, they have logged in uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's speech before the United Nations. It was probably a little partial here, but I think it was a, one of the most eloquent public addresses that I've ever heard in, in my lifetime, uh, where he quotes the, the prophet Isaiah. 
<laughs> quotes Joshua at the end, speaks Hebrew at the end, asks God's blessing uh, on, on the people and so forth. It was, it was brilliant as he, as he likened what's going on right now to what took place in Great Britain uh, in the world under, under Nazism. As he talked about uh, and, and, and bringing out the document uh, where the final solution is he met in the villa two weeks ago and they gave him the document that said, here's the final solution. We're going to kill all of the Jews of the world. And he holds that document before them. <clears throat> and then he, and then he uh, visits um, Dachau and they gave him the, uh, the blueprints that showed the, uh, the gas ovens. And then talked about the fact that, and you had a man stand here a few days ago that said the Holocaust never happened. He says, <clears throat> I've been to my in-laws and I've seen their, their serial numbers branded on their wrist. Were they lying? Were all those that survived lying? Was the German government lying all, all these years? You allowed it to happen. You brought a guy that came in here and says it never happened and he wants to do it again. And he said, shame on you. Shame on you. It was, I mean, he, he took some time leading up to that point. That was the sound bite that you might have caught on the news. But he's making the parallel again. We're on the verge of this once again, as the Bible said. As the Bible said, Iran, Russia, bitter enemies for thousands of years. But now they're partners. And they're partners against Israel, as Ezekiel said. We're just on the verge of all these things. It's incredible. But again, it should hasten us to want to really get serious about the Lord and really get serious about, about living our lives before others in such a way to give us a platform for sharing the gospel and taking a few chances. You know, maybe they won't like you. Maybe you'll hurt their feelings. Maybe they won't talk to you again for a while. But I think we live in a day where we need to take a few risks and, uh, and tell others uh, about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, you uh, tell us in Acts 1-8 that the Holy Spirit shall come upon us so that we can be your witnesses. So Lord, that's, that's what we, we uh, certainly see that we need to do when we study the book of Revelation. We, we feel like we're watching the sand pass through the hourglass and there's uh, not enough uh, time left for us. Uh, and yet life is busy. We have our problems and uh, our days are consumed with, sometimes with just the practical stuff of living. Lord, I pray that we would um, be open and receive uh, your Holy Spirit afresh and anew, that you might empower us to be your witnesses. Lord, you're going to empower power tremendously the, the 144,000 that will go around the world and, and give them what probably we would consider supernatural giftings in order to get the gospel out. In terms of language and protection, Lord, we just uh, pray even as we think about that, we quoted Joel and, and uh, really the, the gifting of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that began there. And Acts 2 will continue all the way through the tribulation period. And uh, we pray that you would uh, fill us afresh and anew that, uh, because we, really, we can't really do these things in and of our, ourselves. In, an, in of our own strength. And it wouldn't be good to even try, Lord. So we just pray that we could be empty vessels through which you, you could work. We ask this in Jesus' name. Now I praise Amen.